All right, let's go on to some myocardial and pericardial abnormalities. So this is a nice one you can see very nicely on CT here, right? Fatty infiltration and thickening of that free right ventricular wall. Just classic finding for arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Now, the thing I find very interesting about this study is the left ventricle, clearly dysplastic as well with that focal irregular thinning of the myocardium. And this prompted me to investigate all this. I never realized this. All I did was focus on that right ventricle. Might have had something to do with the name <laughs> of this particular entity, but I never realized until reading more on this that this is something that can involve the entirety of the myocardium and often can be progressive, uh, first involving the right ventricle and presenting with arrhythmias, but ultimately uh, involving the left ventricle as well in the manner you see here. So that actually is not an inborn uh, developmental thing, but something that can follow uh, the right ventricular involvement. So very nice depiction of it. Look at that thickening and fatty infiltration there of that right ventricular wall. It goes, it's throughout the entire extent of the RV. I didn't annotate this one because I figured you guys could all find the right ventricular myocardium. And then when we go through again, look at that left ventricle, that irregular thinning there in the left lateral wall and along to the inferior aspect. That is ARVD, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Our next one is IHSS, and this is asymmetric septal predominant left ventricular hypertrophy. You can see that free wall, the left lateral uh, left ventricle wall is really pretty normal in thickness. So this is a typical distribution of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. IHSS or subaortic stenosis. I used to call this the most named pathologic entity in medicine. There you can see that septal portion of the myocardium much thicker than the other portions. And this typically causes a shouldering. Let's go back and just show it. Right there at the top of the muscular septum where it can cause aortic outflow narrowing. Right, You can see that's beginning to happen. It's not terrible here, but it definitely uh, is starting. Right? And you can see this is narrowed. It should be the same width really as the aortic valve. So this looks good on the coronal as well. You can really see the differential asymmetric thickening of that septum on the coronal plane. All right, so that is IHSS. And our last one is a pericardial case, and this is a classic. It's just the secondary findings and the uh, physiologic manifestations of this are such that I absolutely had to show it. So of course there's pericardial calcification, and I think based on that, most everyone already knows, right? This is going to be a case of histoplasmosis. But look how we're, we are dealing with restrictive pericarditis. The ventricles are, uh, are definitely compressed, the atria are enlarged because they are less involved with that calcified pericardium. Lower down, you can see there's a defect in the pericardium that allowed a little left ventricular aneurysm to form. So watch for that on the video. It's interesting. It just shows how much pressure uh, those ventricles are under. And then look at that uh, IVC distension and the coronary sinus distension. Look, you can see the cardiac veins, the great in the middle there, entering in, and the small for that matter, and just massive dilation of the coronary sinus, uh, all related to the increased uh, right ventricular and probably right atrial pressures. Then lastly, we've got uh, liver enlargement and ascites and IVC distension, probably developing some chronic passive congestion of the liver. Uh, related to uh, venous return obstruction. So again, the atria are a little large, the IVC is huge, the coronary sinus enormous, and you got a little nodular contour to the liver consistent with chronic passive congestion. 
there's that little ventricular aneurysm pooching through a tiny pericardial defect there. So that is histoplasmosis with calcific pericarditis and a restrictive pericardial physiology. Pretty impressive. All right, I do have a few coronary cases, but as promised, we're not gonna talk about uh, any stenoses here. So our first one is pretty straightforward. There's almost no differential for this. Calcified coronary artery aneurysms. It's pretty much always going to be Kawasaki disease. Every once in a while, uh, perhaps one of the vasculitides or an IV drug user might develop these, but uh, I have not run into any trouble just saying, I think Kawasaki's is your first choice. Uh, this one's interesting in that there was clearly an inflammatory process and it ultimately resulted in occlusion. That's the right coronary and it's got no contrast in it whatsoever. So that's kind of a, a chronic post-inflammatory complication for this particular patient. And the 3D is nice here. You can see the calcific rim of that aneurysm and you can also see that occluded right coronary right here which we ought to be seeing on that surface shaded display. There they are, multiple calcified. And there was the right coronary occlusion with some retrograde filling. So again, calcified aneurysms and a right coronary occlusion. Relatively young patient, also suggesting this was Kawasaki. Nice 3D, there's that occluded segment of the right coronary and there are the aneurysms, that's what they look like on a good 3D projection. Let's do that one one more time. There's that right coronary and the left coronary aneurysms. All right, this next one you may not have seen. Uh, this was always one of my favorite entities. So there's an apical infarct, little focus of fatty metaplasia. That's how you can spot an infarct. They can be uh, submucosal or, uh, or peripheral, right, subpericardial. Uh, either way, that little strip of hypodensity is very suggestive of an infarct. Now, you do have to be careful down here in the left ventricular apex. Sometimes you can have a little pericardial fat pooching up in there. Uh, but this is just a little too high up into the myocardium itself to ignore. And the source of this, ultimately, I'm not sure what... Uh, Huh, I'm sorry, that's an incorrect image there. I'm not sure how that got in there. But this is a, what's called a myobridge, and it's more apparent right here. The, the early segment of the proximal LAD is dipping down into the myocardium itself instead of sitting on top of it like a good coronary should. So it's diving down into the myocardium. And this is one of those rare instances where the surface shaded really help you because here it is right here. And you can see it diving down into the substance of the myocardium. So that short segment, this is known as a myobridge. And that short segment is obviously at risk, right? Every time the heart contracts, that myocardium surrounding that coronary is contracting on it and pinching it off. So there it is, diving into the myocardium, right? And then popping out to a normal position. You can always tell the LAD because it runs right on the anterior side of the interventricular septum, right? So find that septum and you know you're on the LAD. So here's the LAD, see it diving into the myocardium and then popping out to a normal position. And then we're going to circle that little focal apical infarct farther down. Right, probably the result of compression of the proximal LAD. So that is a myobridge. 
Uh, one fascinating thing is the first one of these I saw, uh, I was told by the referring clinician, well, you can't stent those, it's gotta be bypassed. And so I carried that black pearl with me for some time until I was uh, fortunately corrected. You can stent these, uh, in fact, they're stented fairly frequently. Oftentimes, it takes a couple of serial stents to, to get it because this segment of compressed LED can be fairly long, uh, but they can, in fact, be stented, so good to know. And there's that apical infarct, and here it is, diving into the myocardium. Really nice depiction there. Let's look at that one more time. There it is in the myocardium right there. And there it is proximally. Again, the circus shaded is really helpful here. You can see that segment where it just dives in. That's probably the best view of it. And there one more time. All right, a myo bridge with a distal infarct. All right, this next one is great. I told you I read for Manhattan and uh, Beverly Hills, and this this uh, <laughs> this is the result of frivolous utilization of medical resources. This patient was asymptomatic and simply got a coronary CTA because he could, right? These uh, these patients were all paying cash on the barrel head. I was doing this stuff 15 years ago. Incidentally, I have not seen a significant improvement in image quality. Uh, I'm really pleased to say all this stuff holds up uh with the stuff they're doing today so anyway these uh these patients were all paying cash on the barrel head for their colonoscopies or their coronary ctas um and you know because there was no reimbursement code back then and still isn't actually for coronary cta so there is a proximal lad actually left main calcification there and now look at this that again subendothelial right, hypodensity that is so characteristic of an infarct. Now you'll see that is way more extensive. So again, there's a little calcification, hard to tell if the left main is stenosed or not, but then look at the extent of that hypodensity all throughout the lateral and inferior wall, of the left ventricle, there's no question, that is an infarct. So what happened was I got a call from the head of radiology at this facility and he said, well, you've really done it now. You know, you gave this guy an infarct and now he's furious because he hasn't had any symptoms. He says you're wrong and now he can't get insurance. <laughs> I just, you know, what can you do? That is an infarct. That is undoubtedly uh, a subendothelial infarct, right? And now the important point here is look at that. It's not stenosed. Right, and that was the argument we had, that this guy's left main, well, the, yes, there's a calcification there, but there's no narrowing, it doesn't fit. Well, it does fit. That's a watershed area uh, where that infarct developed, and this is a great demonstration of what's really going on in atherosclerotic plaque formation. This guy had a plaque, it ruptured, and it healed. So this was stenosed at some point, and very critically, Right, but those calcification spots that you see in the coronary arteries, they're sites of previous ruptured plaques that have then undergone evolution. So you don't have to necessarily see a occlusive plaque or stenotic plaque here to explain the presence of that infarct. That dot of calcium says this was where the problem was. So that is a left main atherosclerotic plaque with an associated infarct. Okay, some congenital stuff. So I picked my three favorite congenitals and uh, then we'll be on to our next section and we're right on time, so I'm very pleased. All right, so this is an aortic interruption. You'll be able to appreciate this on the movie, but basically the aortic arch comes here and then starts here. And it is an extreme example of a coart where there is no longer communication between the proximal and distal aortic lumen. And so all the flow for this patient is coming from all these dilated vessels, bronchial arteries, internal mammaries, and intercostal arteries are all massively dilated and are providing all of the arterial flow to this patient's lower extremities. 
So here you see the aortic arch and its discontinuity. And then you pick up the descending thoracic there. And you can see throughout all the dilated collaterals, the internal mammaries are particularly striking, but the intercostals are pretty impressive as well. They're all tortuous and dilated. Even some of your phrenic vessels, uh, superior and inferior epigastrics, all of these are prominent. This makes for a beautiful 3D, and you'll really be able to appreciate, see those two blind pouches for the aorta? They just stop, right? And there's no communication between them. Look at the size of those internal mammaries on the anterior, and look at those intercostals. Now you can really appreciate their tortuosity, right? They're coils of dilated tortuous vessels. Pretty striking. So that is an extreme coart, or just simply an aortic, a congenital aortic interruption. All right, our next one, it's just a big PDA, but it's a very nice example. So there it is, right between the aorta, and these come off on the top portion of the very proximal left PA, right? They're just past the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery and they come off the superior aspect of it. Huge dilated pulmonary artery right, due to the uh, left-right shunting and usually your cardiac chambers right, not as dramatically enlarged. So there's the PDA, and you can see the aortic contrast is less dense than the pulmonary arterial. So you can appreciate the left to right shunting that's going on into the pulmonary artery. Right, pretty straightforward. Left side of the heart is a little bit large from overcirculation, but the right side typically not very affected. So that's a PDA. And our last one for cardiac CT, this is a transposition, an L transposition. I think the, the most striking thing here is that you've got a pulmonic valve that's uh, reversed places, right, with the aortic. The aortic uh, valve should be, the aortic valve should be sitting in the center of the heart on all planes and in all views, right? So you can see the, the three cusps and the coronary origins there in that more anterior vascular structure in the wrong place entirely. And you've got a pulmonary artery coming out of the middle of the heart there. All right, so this is a non-compacted ventricle. It's worth noting. You see how there's all that trabeculation and it really almost looks like the, the left ventricular myocardium is unraveling. Right? That is a non-compacted ventricle and it is frequently associated uh, with other congenital abnormalities. There are a few reports of isolated non-compacted ventricle, and that can be a primary cause of, uh, of congestive heart failure, because obviously it's not, not a very effective pumping mechanism. So there's that pulmonary artery coming out of the middle and the aorta, right, and a beautiful view of that non-compacted ventricle. And so that you saw that pulmonary arterial bifurcation there coming out of the middle of the heart, pretty striking. All right, so that is an L transposition. Uncorrected, surgically uncorrected. Those are the ones that can live. The Ds don't make it without surgery. 